Hey everyone and welcome back to the SAS community channel where we share stories and lessons about SAS. I'm your host Gwen Shapira and here I am again talking to myself. Don't worry, there will be guests here next week. If you want to be notified about future episodes, including next week's with guests, uh, click subscribe and you will get notified through the magic that is YouTube. So for today's topic, I wanted to talk to myself and to you about something that is a bit abstract, uh, but I want to make it concrete with examples and stories and some good tips. And the topic I want to talk about is quality. And as you know, I'm starting a company with my co-founders uh, Ram and uh, Dan Olud. And one of the things that we really value, that is really important to the three of us that we're so passionate about, is making sure that what we do is really high quality. We want to write high quality software, high quality documentation, high quality website. We want everything to be really, really good. And we constantly talk how this should be world class, that should be world class. When I put up the podcast, the first thing that Ram asked me, the providers that you use to host the podcast on, is it a world class provider? Is that the best you could find? Because even the things that most people never even see, like who is hosting my podcast, is uh, really important to use the best and have high quality and world class as a value. And so this topic is like very much top of mind for me. Uh, but the problem with high quality is that it's really hard to define. Uh, so one of my favorite books growing up was Zen and the Art of the Motorci Motorcycle Maintenance. And a really good chunk of the book is the author trying to define quality and what happens to him as he's trying to get to the bottom of what is quality. And the whole thing just shows how incredibly complicated it is because quality has to be immediate. You have to be able to notice it, see it, hear it. I just paid, I don't know how much for extra fancy microphone. I expect to be able to immediately hear without special audio training that it sounds better than the MacBook audio that I used before. By the way, if you can hear any difference, definitely let me know in the comments. I want to know if the investment was worth it. So we do expect that without special training, a layman will be able to tell that something is high quality, but there is definitely also an element of context and experience that kind of can create a richer experience of quality. And of course, the standard example is wine. I can tell that some wines I like, some wines I don't like, but I know that people who spend a lot of time really training themselves in that topic and uh, trying to, reading about it, trying a lot of different wines, trying to remember it, really being intentional, they can probably enjoy wine, good wine, a lot more than I do. Uh, on the other hand, I have 20 years of experience doing code reviews and I can tell a lot about engineers by looking at their code and I can probably tell what is good, bad code, good code, great code in a lot of different domains, different languages, different styles of coding, different paradigms, like it, because a richer experience kind of lets you differentiate a lot more of the experience. Uh, I'm wondering if I'm the only one who enjoys doing code reviews, but yeah, I think it's in many ways a lot of fun to read code. So my opinions aside, if when you look at products, really the final judge of is this product high quality is the customer. So because the product is so important to us, we went and talked to a lot of potential customers and we kind of asked them what makes a SaaS experience high quality for them, what is a high quality product. And it turns out that it can actually, on one hand, be very nuanced. And on the other hand, we actually got very clear and consistent lessons and takeaway. So first of all, a lot of companies and cultures kind of confuse lack of bugs with high quality. And this is a big mistake. Like a product can have a lot of bugs, but still offer a high quality of experience. And I'll give a bunch of examples later of products that were very buggy at some point, but I absolutely loved. And the other hand, there are products that have 
almost no dogs that actually work very well as, as expected, but are not delightful to use. They do not bring joy. So you use them because you have to, because your HR department or finance signed you up for them. But it is, I don't know if I can call something that I use only because I'm forced to a high quality product. So clearly the user experience really matters. And this gets us to my definition of a high quality product. I believe that the product is high quality if it offers an absolutely magical experience to the user in specific circumstances and dimensions that the user really cares about. And then if that happens, the users will be a lot more lenient about bugs and issues in other places because that's not a place where they care about. So some examples. I remembered I was a very early Slackware Linux user. It was very buggy back then, didn't support a wide range of hardware, a lot of stuff did not work, but it was the first time I could run Unix on my desktop at home and not in the lab in the university, which meant that I can actually do my computer homework at home, which is a much better experience than, than having to do them in the lab. So I dealt with a lot of crappy bugs just to be able to do that. My, the first time I used a car navigation system, it kept crashing. Like every 20 minutes or so it crashed because of something. But it was still so much better than having to stop on the side of the road, look at all those gigantic maps that kept tearing. It was fantastic. Bugs figured themselves out eventually. Uh, early Kafka. We had bugs, but it was easy to get started with, easy to install. And it had really good uptime. We basically almost never had to maintain it. So uh, even though there were some bugs and people kept filing bugs and we kept fixing bugs, it kept growing in adoption because it offered a great experience at the specific points it mattered and a certain type of scalability for specific workloads that just nothing else could really provide. So here we are. Also early Twitter and the fail well, it never stopped me from using Twitter. To this day, nothing could stop you from doing, doing Twitter, I guess. A Datadog, super easy to get started with, super easy to report data into. The reports themselves, we found a bunch of bugs, Datadog fixed it, we remained uh, happy users. And uh, things like Expensify, being able to take photos of your um, receipts instead of having to carry them around as you travel, and I used to travel quite a lot, that was amazing. Like it could have a lot of bugs everywhere else, but just this one feature meant that I loved using it. So really, the really big lesson that I want to give you in this video is that you need to figure out this one thing in your product, or maybe a bit more, but this one experience that your users really care about, that this will delight them, it will change their lives, it will be meaningful to them, and really get that right, get it magical. This should be smooth and bug-free and perfect. And then if you get that right, the fact that there is a lot of rough edges elsewhere, it's not going to matter all that much. And I have an early Confluent story, very, very early in my Confluent career. We basically hired someone uh, to be a training developer, just write classes for our users. And she was amazing. And later on, she went on to play much bigger roles in the company. But I think on her second day, she kind of showed up at the area where all the engineers uh, sat. And she said, look, when I write my training, I really like building them with a specific use case. So the users will feel like as they go through the training, they learn and they also implement something useful. And what is like a good, you know, use case that should just work in Kafka. And I think I said, well, you know, it seems to be popular to get data out of a database. So maybe like take MySQL, get some data out of it, write it to Kafka, do something simple like, you know, word count with a, a Kafka streams and then dump the results into S3. It's not super meaningful, but it's fairly easy and a lot of people do it. It should definitely work. That seems very reasonable for a beginner class. It seemed simple. I absolutely thought it should just work. Think about how like green pass it is. Like it's all things like I did not crash machines. There was no chaos testing. There was no high load. You know, I didn't do anything special. This was like very basic things that we wrote Kafka and connect and Kafka streams for. 
um, but it was also, I believe, early 2016 at the time. And so she tried it, and two days later she came back and said, Gwen, it doesn't work. And I was like, I don't remember if I was a Connect developer or a PM, but I thought, there's no way it doesn't work. I use Connect all the time. Of course it works. And she told me, Gwen, I tried it. It does not work. Uh, so I went with her and I sat with her and I continued sitting with her every day for the next two and a half weeks until it finally worked. <laughs> and we found so many issues and most of them were not something you would actually describe as a bug, but like non-obvious configurations that you had to set so things would actually match together because the default format in which stuff was dumped from MySQL to Kafka was not in a good format that was very easy to process in Kafka streams. And then the default result in Kafka stream, we couldn't really get it in a reasonable way to S3. So we really had to do a lot of massaging, adjusting uh, to get it exactly right. And obviously none of it was documented anywhere. Right? Users had to figure it out on them themselves. And this is the opposite of a magical experience, right? The magical experience would be that you turn this connector on, you turn that connector on, you'd write some code in Kafka streams that would be fairly obvious to write because it's just a group by, and that's it, you'd be done. So this basically what I'm trying to say is hire this person. And it's not a QA person because traditionally QA do not think as a customer does. I think Confluent QA does, but I've never seen any other QA team that doesn't test one product, but they really create end-to-end -end flows. They think like a user. A user is not trying to use one feature or one API. The user is trying to get a job done that usually integrates a lot of APIs and creates a complete experience. And you want to make sure that all those integration points are so smooth and so nice. So really think what would the user who uses this product for the first time, what would they really want to accomplish? Why are they even getting it? And then make sure that the first things that they try to do will absolutely work. No special configurations, like no bugs, not even a lot of reading docs for that matter. Like it should be super, super crazy simple. And if you can get that, users will forgive you for a lot of other problems. I had a um, way to describe it. I called it embarrassingly stupid bugs. And I actually used it as a metric when I was a product manager. I felt like if a user basically runs into blockers, show-stopping bugs within the first 10 minutes of using the product, this is embarrassing because we should have done those 10 minutes ourselves and not push it to them to do. And I accept, basically my target was zero stupid embarrassing bugs. I'm okay with a lot of other bugs because you now if something is complex, users will understand that there could be issues. Like if I'm trying to push crazy large load, you know, like very difficult natural conditions, people will understand there are problems. But if uh, I'm doing something super simple that should have been like the green pass, the things that just works, people are not very forgiving around it. And by the way, eventually we built an entire automated system around those customer workflows that every time we wouldn't ship a release if this customer workflow was not basically perfect. So I talked to myself maybe for enough. I have one last tip around the quality for those who are still listening. Uh, Basically, there are cases, I talked a lot about quality as something that is experienced by a customer, but there are a lot of cases where quality can actually be quantified. And reliability of production systems, a lot of times quality can actually be quantified. And you usually want some kind of a metric around how often bad things happen, or do bad things happen now more than they used to happen before. And this is really important to know. And usually we use SLOs that are a very good tool to catch how often are bad things happening in our system. But many years ago, I learned from one uh, data scientist, uh, Josh Wills, that about another really good tool that statisticians apparently all know about, but it's really useful for us humans to also know about. And it's called the control chart. And the idea around the control chart is that you basically take some metrics that you care about, maybe response time latency or some API or response time latency of all APIs, 
and you plot it over time, just all the dots, and then you define a range of normal values. And you have a lot of flexibility on how you define it. It can be an average and then some standard deviation bands. It can be maybe adaptive average. So if you always have a kind of a drop latency on weekends when nobody does anything, you can kind of adapt to the what is normal on a weekend versus what is normal on a rush hour. Uh, you can do these bands per machine, per user, per API, per a lot of different things. And after you do that, you basically get a collection of points that are over time and either above or below what is called normal. And then you start applying rules to them. And that's kind of the cool part because you can do any, like the rules are very, very flexible. So it can be any one point that is more than three standard deviations uh, from my, what I call, consider my baseline. And this basically indicates that suddenly one very extreme uh, thing happened. You know, like the one time that writing to disk took a second. Like this is very extreme and you may want to alert on w each one of those or maybe alerting on even one extreme disk blip is too much, but collecting them and sending them automatically to your cloud vendor to complain about would make sense. And um, maybe sometimes it's actually a collection of dots that are above uh, the normal range, maybe not quite as high, maybe even a collection of dots with um, you know, 20 millisecond uh, disk write. It's already slightly higher than what I would consider normal. If it keeps happening and you see a lot of them, maybe this is worth taking some action. And then one of the more useful ones is basically a series of dots that keep increasing. So it started as bad and it kept getting worse. So you, the main thing about control chart is that they're incredibly flexible and you can detect a really wide range of conditions, you know, sudden burst, slow increase, a sustained, not so bad problem, but just that keeps happening over time. And you can detect it. You, it. It's very clear because control charts are kind of visual. It's very easy to communicate it to upper management that, hey, <laughs> this one thing is not bad, but look at how it keeps happening. Look at how it's happening now more often than it did before. So it's it could be a very useful tool to help in maintaining production quality. So that's uh, it for today. It was maybe slightly longer than I actually expected it to be. I hope you enjoyed listening to me talking to myself for about 20 minutes and maybe you learned something uh, useful. Let us know in the comments. I'm always happy to get inspiration from community questions and community discussion. So thank you very much.